big word, a long word. Let me tell you what it means. It means it's a term that's applied to the work of um, uh, blah, 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 uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, here we go. Shares the belief that philosophical thinking begins with the human subject. Not merely the thinking subject, but the acting and the feeling and the living human individual. So what is it? It's all about the person, about you, and all about me. That's existentialism. Hey, I said it right, huh? Praise the Lord. Now, biblically, what is it called? Self. That's what it's called. Biblically, the word applies, not that big old long word, you know, $30 word to it, but um, it's just about self. What does it mean, though? It means that in this day and age, as we all know and read, there's, there's, it means that there's no absolutes. It means everything is all relative to whatever you want it to be. Whatever your thought is, whatever's relative to you, whatever floats your boat, you can believe about it, whatever it is, or believe in it, whatever it is. It's all relative, and the only thing that is absolute is that there are no absolutes. That's the way it is. That's what today's environment is all about. You can't say anything is right or wrong anymore. Each person is to determine what is right or wrong according to themselves. Well, that might be good for you, or no, I don't think that's right, or I don't think that's wrong. I'm doing it. I'm not hurting anyone about it or through it. So what's good for me may not be good for you, but I'm going to do it regardless. That's relativism. You can't tell anyone anymore, even biblically, biblically. You can't bring the Bible, and I'm speaking about a believer, you can't bring the Bible to someone and say, Hey, bro, let me, let me show you what the Word says. And they're like, oh, well, well, it doesn't apply to me. It doesn't mean anything to me. You may want to follow it, or they'll say, oh, well, that's Old Testament stuff. That's Old Testament. It doesn't apply because I'm a New Testament believer. So it even happens in the church, whether you're talking about, you know, the world's music or the world's movies or the world's attitudes is, is, is just that of self. I want to do what I want to do, and, and that's all there is to it. And it's not only in the world. That's the sad thing about it, guys. It's not only in the world, but it's in the church as well. People no longer want to believe that the Word of God is inerrant, that, that the Word of God is infallible, and the truths of Jesus are not applicable to them in today's culture, today's circumstances, or even today's church. They don't want to apply basic biblical fundamentals in their life because they don't particularly believe it is relevant for them to do so. In fact, they say it's irrelevant. They say it's outdated. They say it's old-fashioned. Instead, we're to have more positive thinking, more self-awareness, to know that you are a master of your own ship, that you steer your own ship. Listen, guys, you can't, I can't, we can't do anything as Christians apart from Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit. We can't be smarter, we can't be stronger, we can't be tougher, we can't be more loving, we can't be more caring, we can't be more understanding, we can't be more empathetic without the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't be any of those things. And that, that's for believers. I'm not even talking about those that are not saved or are not unbelievers. You and I, as believers in Jesus, cannot do anything apart from me, he says. John 15 tells us that. 
We can do nothing apart from Jesus Christ. The people in the book of Judges, you can turn back to 19, they've they've drifted far. They've drifted far from their reliance upon the Lord, their belief in the Lord, and their obedience to the Lord. Everyone did. That is the theme. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes, just because they wanted to and just because they could. Being that there was no king around, there was no authority around, also meant that they didn't fall, feel like they fell under the authority of God. And we read about that already with Micah and inventing his own religion and doing his own house church thing and, and having his own Levitical priest, well, Levite, in his home to be the priest of his home. I'm doing what I want to do because I can do it. See, that's, that's what we're talking about. So in verse 1 of chapter 19, it says this, And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite stain in the remote mountains of Ephraim. He took for himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. So again, no king, meaning no authority. And it's because of this that we have seen and will see in the following chapters people doing whatever they want to do. Whatever they want to do. And everything is apart from the Lord. We're told in verse 1, this guy's a Levite. It's part of the Levitical line. Those Levites, part of the tribe of Levi, were called to serve and be those stewards in the church, in the temple. And this guy, supposedly one who is serving in the temple, now gets for himself a concubine. What? What's a, what's a Levite doing with a concubine? Now remember, a concubine was not a wife. The concubine, well, like a wife even in those days, but was property. The Bible, the old, in, in the old Testament or in the King James Version, might call chattel. Just property. Now, there are certain rights that the concubine had that were equal even to the, the wife and so forth. I'm not going to bore you with all that stuff, but um, this was allowable in the Old Testament law. But it was not ordained, sanctioned, or desired by God. Not at all. And as we move through the scriptures in the redemptive history, we learn that it was never his desire, the Lord's desire. Yet, he allowed it. It's kind of interesting. Because having a concubine goes against and flies in the face of everything that is considered the marriage covenant and the intention of marriage altogether. Jesus says, and he would say this many times to those religious leaders, have you not read, speaking of the Old Testament, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh, it tells us in Genesis chapter 2 and also reiterated in Ephesians chapter 5. Jesus says, have you not heard? Then in Ephesians 5, it goes on to say, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself. It doesn't say so love his own concubine as himself, does it? So Jesus uses this story, uses this type of story to tell them that Having a concubine or even uh, divorce was not in the plan of God or the desire of God. But as Jesus said, that Moses allowed it only as an option due to and because of the hardness of the heart of the people. That's the only reason why. It was never a commandment, a requirement, an okay. Well, we do know in Scripture there is... An out, if you will, uh, an acceptable thing for a writ of divorce, which was one of sexual immorality. 
But again, even that is a choice because it's not a command. We have to understand that. It, not was, it was not because of God's heart nor His intent, but as it's put in the Scriptures, because of the hardness of man's hearts that this was allowed and given in and regulated then and given even in the Old Testament those regulations to live by according to the issue of having a concubine. Verse 2, it says, but, this, but his concubine played the harlot against him and went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judah and there were four and there were wait and was there for wow and was there for whole months your bibles all might also might mean in the margin a year and four months it kind of doesn't matter but either way it was it was at least four months or a, or a year and four months it says that she played the harlot meaning that she in the in the King James uh, translation, it speaks of the fact that she just basically played around, sexually played around, immorally sexually played around, that she runs away now. She's been unfaithful. Verse 3, it says, then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back, having his servant and a couple of donkeys with him. So she brought him into her father's house, and when the father of the young woman saw him, he was glad to meet him. So the father, his father-in-law, the father of this concubine, he had, she had been with him, she had gone to his home, and he was glad. He was glad to see this Levite. He was glad to see this guy. It might have been even the first time he ever laid eyes on him, you know, thinking, Wow, son-in-law, and he's a Levite. Wow, maybe there's something here that can do to turn my daughter around because as a father, he knew what his daughter was up to. As, as a father, he, he knew what was going on behind the scenes, so to speak, with his daughter. And so he was very glad to see this Levite. Verses 4 through 10 Reads like this. Now his father-in-law, the young woman's father, detained him and stayed with him three days. So they ate and drank and lodged there. Then it came to pass on the fourth day that they arose early in the morning and he stood to depart. But the young woman's father said to his son-in-law, Refresh your heart with a morsel of bread and afterward go your way. Verse 6. So they sat down and the two of them ate and drank together. Then the young woman's father said to the man, Please be content to stay all night. And let your heart be merry. And when the man stood to depart, his father-in-law urged him, so he lodged there again. Verse 8. Then he arose early in the morning on the fifth day. So he's been there four days. Now he's on the fifth day. So he's been there like almost a week to depart. But the young woman's father said, please refresh your heart. So they delayed until afternoon and both of them ate. And when the man stood to depart, he and his concubine and his servant his father-in-law, the young woman's father, said to him, Look, the day is now drawing uh, toward evening. Please spend the night. See, the day is coming to an end. Lodge here that your heart may be merry. Tomorrow, tomorrow, go your way so that you may get home. Verse 10, However, the man was not willing to spend that night. So he, ro he rose and departed and came opposite Jebus, that is Jerusalem, with him were the two saddled donkeys. His concubine was also with him. So these verses that we read show us a few things, just to highlight them. Shows us the heart of the father, I believe, really wanting his daughter to be reconciled back to her husband, possibly. In the sense of, you know, gosh, I've, I've met you for the first time. You're a Levite. Oh, man, you know what? I know what my daughter's been up to. I know what kind of shenanigans she's been playing around uh, with. And I know possibly, you know, uh, maybe she's hurt you and this and that. But, you know, maybe I can play a part of reconciling. Maybe I can play a part of, of helping sh her see and understand and with you here. And, you know, you can't blame the dad, can you? Think about you here, parents who have daughters. And, and this is a situation maybe similar or like it to where... You know, there was an opportunity maybe brought before you, and you're like, no, maybe I have an opportunity here to do something, 
to change something. To help my daughter see the error of her ways. To help my daughter maybe begin to live a life of godliness and holiness. Just possibly. That's the heart of the father here. You can't blame him for that. Maybe she was his only daughter. I don't know. Scriptures don't tell us otherwise. He and his son-in-law, he desired to reconcile them back together. Wasn't anything wrong by that? But the question lies in this. Regardless of the father's heart, was it the will of God? I think that's what we have to look at. Is it the will of God that this Levite be joined together with this concubine? I say no. Because of the fact that biblically we know it's not the desire of the Lord to have this man have a concubine. But according to the Father's eyes, what was the good and the right thing? Well, to to reconcile his daughter back to her husband. But unfortunately, it wasn't according to the Lord. I believe it's important. Remember chapter 21, verse 25. Everyone did right. That was right according to their own eyes. So the father saw according to his perception what the good and right thing would be. But not seeking the Lord, not doing what the Lord wanted or truly would desire. Putting his own feelings ahead of what God wants, the Lord's priority. And like I said, you can't blame the dad for doing that, can you? You can't blame him for that. However, yet we, like the Father, must be, and you must be, and I must be, we must be putting the things of God ahead of our own feelings, ahead of our own desires, and ahead of our own wants to truly do what the Lord wants. You know, let the Lord reconcile his daughter. Let the Lord reconcile your children, my children. Not us, not you. We also see that that in Jerusalem, it wasn't called Jerusalem at the time. It was called Jebus because the Jebusites were there. It wasn't until the time of King David that he ousted the Jebusites and then therefore renamed it and called it Jerusalem. So verse 11 and 12, they were near Jabus, Jebus. The day was far spent. So remember, they left late in the afternoon, and so now they're approaching Jebus, and the day was far spent. So it's gone a while, and the servant said to his master, come, please, and let us turn into the city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. It makes perfect sense. But his master said to him, we will not, that's the Levite, we will not turn here aside here into the city of foreigners who are not of the children of Israel, we will go on to Gibeah. I find this comment by this Levite very interesting. The Levite tells his servant that we're we're not staying in a place where there are no Israelites. We're not staying in a place where there's no people of God. We're not staying in a place, we could say today, where there's no Christians. Now, there's no Christians in that place. Why would I want to stay there? Well, they'll go to Gibeah. Okay, they'll go where the Gibeonites are, where they would feel safer. Now, this is, like I said, interesting and kind of crazy to me because remember, this guy's a Levite. He's very, and he has a concubine. And now he's all concerned about not staying in a place that is not occupied by the children of Israel. It's kind of interesting. And he says, you know, look, uh, I'm not going to hang out with a bunch of sinners. (laughs) I don't want to do that. Yet here, his own life, does it really demonstrate and reflect that of that godly servant? I say, no, it doesn't. He's being kind of hypocritical here in his thinking. That's what comes to mind to me. 
is like, well, you know, hypocrite. Verses 13 through 15, so he said to his servant, come let us go near to one of these places and spend the night in Gibeah or Ramah. And they passed by and went their way, and the sun went down on them near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. So the tribe of Benjamin, the area of Gibeah belonged to them, the Benjamites, one of the tribes, one of the 12 tribes, and says they turned aside there to go in to lodge in Gibeah. And when he went in, he sat down in the open square of the city, for no one would take them into his house to spend the night. So they go to this place, supposedly, where there's believers, fellow Israelites. It's kind of comical. He sits in the square with his donkeys and his servant and his concubine, just sitting there, waiting for someone to say, hey, what are you doing here? It's late at night, and bro, why don't you guys come and stay with us the night? That way you'll be safe, you'll be protected, you know? That was supposed to happen. In fact, um, it is the, was the city's responsibility to do that. But no one did. Verses 16 through 20 just then the old man came in from his work in the field at evening, also, who also was from the mountains of Ephraim, so from a same place. He was staying in Gibeah, whereas the men of this place were Benjamites. And when he raised his eyes, he saw the traveler in the open square of the city, and the old man said, where are you going? Where do you come from? So he said, we are, trans- we are passing from Bethlehem in Judah toward the remote mountains of Ephraim. I am from there. I went to Bethlehem in Judah. Now I am going to the house of the Lord. And remember, the house of the Lord at the time was Shiloh, not Jerusalem, because there was no Jerusalem. It was Jebus. But there was no one who will take me into his house. Verse 19. Although we both have straw, we have both straw and fodder, meaning food, supplies for our donkeys and bread and wine for myself, for your female servant and for the young man, who is with your servant, there is no lack of anything. And the old man said, well, peace be with you. It's like, wow, peace be with you. Let all your needs be my responsibility. Only do not spend the night in the open square. This guy runs into him in there, and no one has taken them in, and he's like, hey, what are you guys doing out here? It's late at night, and you're in the middle of the square. What's up? And he tells him he's from this area of Ephraim. It's like, hey, so am I. Wow. Well, once you come in and the guy says, you know, I don't understand it. You know, we've got everything, all these supplies. We've got everything for ourselves. All we need is really just a bed to sleep in, a a room to stay in. We can supply our own needs. But the man says, ah, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Uh, Come on in and stay with me and don't use your stuff. Come stay with me. Let, Let me bless you, he says. Verses 21 and 22 So he brought him into his house and gave fodder to the donkeys and washed their feet and and they washed their feet and they ate and drank. And as they were enjoying themselves, suddenly certain men of the city, perverted men, surrounded the house and beat on the door. They spoke to the master of the house, the old man saying, bring out this man who came to your house that we may know him carnally. Now, when we see that in Scripture, that they may know him or man would know a woman, it's speaking specifically um, about uh, um, being sexually intimate with that other person. So that's what we're referring to here. And this should kind of joggle your mind a little bit. It takes you all the way back to Genesis, does it not? It takes you all the way back to Genesis, and, and it's like, you know what, um, Very, very familiar. So the men that were like in the times of Sodom and Gomorrah with Lot and one of the angels is the same type of thing here. They were were homosexuals. And that's, you know, they want to know this guy sexually. And they're making demands. They're banging on the door, surrounding the house even. Man. Now remember, They're in Gibeah, are they not? Under the authority or under the review or supervision or what have you of of the Benjamites, those who were fellow brothers. So these these are brothers, supposedly. 
But you see, ultimately, the Bible teaches against this, doesn't it? Clearly teaches against homosexuality. Yet today, and then, everyone wants to do what? Chapter 21, verse 25. Do what's right according to what's in their own eyes. To do what's according to their own eyes, what is right by them. It's outside the church. It's inside the church. You know, when you take a stand, when we take a stand on the scriptures at times, especially since this is an issue culturally around in our lives and our culture is so prevalent, people then start labeling, you're a legalist, you know, you're intolerable, you're so unloving, you're so uncaring. And you're calling yourself a Christian. Doesn't, isn't God love? Isn't he love? Well, yeah. He's love. But he's truly holy. And I think that's one of the things that we have to begin to think about as Christians. Is like, you know, God is ultimately, he's a holy God. A manifestation, a characteristic is his love towards us, but he's a holy God. The angels in heaven don't sing love, 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 the Lord Almighty. They sing holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy. The angels declare that. But other than that, if you take a stand for the scriptures, people look at you and say, man, what's your trip? What's your problem? You're so intolerant. You're so unloving. How can you call yourself a a Christian if you're against homosexuality and the gay lifestyle of choice? You're intolerant. Well, we, we know that God does not hate the sinner, but he hates the sin. That's that's the big thing. He hates the sin. God hates this. Why? Because it goes against his holiness, who he is. That's the issue. It goes right against who he is. He's a most holy God. I'll put it to you this way. Because God is love, he hates sin. I've heard this before just recently. Because God loves children, he hates abortion. Because God loves truth, He hates hypocrisy. You know, in order for God to be a God of love, he has to hate something. You have to hate something. If you say you love children, don't call yourself pro-choice. But you have to be pro-life. It's an oxymoron. It's hypocritical. Because you love children... You must hate abortion. That's just the way it goes. That's just the way God is. I can't change God. Neither can you. That's who He is. There's nothing we ever can do to try and change that. But there are those who try to put their heads in the ground and pretend that it's all okay. God is a God of love. And it's important that we understand that because he's a God of love as well, that he is so much for us and so much better for us. And so God does not ordain this. He does not agree with this. And that's God. You've got to take it up with God. Verse 23, an interesting thing, which I, which I believe is, is really not a good thing for this man this, this, this old man who found them in the square, he says, no, my brethren. Oh, man, he calls them brothers. They're not his brothers. Now, in the Middle East today, as it was then, you're, you can bring someone in your home even if they're your enemy. Even if they're your enemy, you are required to bring them into your home if they need shelter for three days. Guess what? On the fourth day, I guess you can kill them, huh? They're your enemy. 
But in three days, you are required to house them. It's still the way it is in the Middle East today. And so, but it's a cultural thing. For you and me, there's there's nothing about that in, in the Bible. That was then. Even today, we call those Christians brothers who are not really our brothers, I believe. 2 John 9.11 tells us, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. And he who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring the, the doctrine, this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him, for he who greets him, guess what? Shares in his evil deeds. Wow. 2 John 9 through 11. Verse 24. Here comes the crazy part. Look, here is my virgin daughter and the man's concubine. So that remember, they're banging on the door. They, they want them to bring the guy out because they want to know him carnally. They want to know him And he says, oh, wait a minute. Here comes this protection thing that I was talking about earlier, the three-day rule. Look, look, here's my virgin daughter and the man's concubine. So the guy, the man is willing to give up his virgin daughter so they'll know her carnally and the man's concubine so they can take advantage of them and rape them. Here's my virgin daughter and the man's concubine. Let me bring them out now. Oh, humble them and do with them as you please. But, in the, but to this man, my guest, do not do such a vile thing. It's crazy, isn't it? This is what happens when people turn their eyes away from the Lord. This is what happens when you and I do not allow the authority of God to rule in our lives. Because without the Lord, you and I will sink really, really, really low. Without the Lord governing our lives, giving us that check in our hearts, showing us incredible discernment and wisdom. Listen. Men and women here in this room. Wherever Jesus is preached, wherever he's preached, women have been lifted up and freed. Wherever the gospel is not allowed and not teached or taught, teached, taught, women are oppressed. Women are thought of as nothing but a product, something of ownership. You... Look at the Middle East today. What you see today where the gospel is not allowed. You've seen plenty of pictures. Women are held hostage. They're all bound up by garments and all you see is the slit of their eyes and that's it. But where the gospel has been taught and where it is preached, women have been elevated. Women have been redeemed and they've been saved. But look at every place. I challenge you. Look every place in the, in, in the world where the gospel is not taught nor accepted, you will find women who are still oppressed and thought of as just property today. It's the way it is. See, that's what the gospel is about. It's about freedom. It's about redemption. It's about salvation. That's what the gospel of Jesus Christ brings to us. Verses 25 through 30. Then the men would not heed him, so the men took his concubine and brought her out to them. And they knew her and abused her all night until morning. And when the day began to break, then they let her go. Then the, women, then the woman came as day was dawning and fell down at the door at the man's house where her master was till night. 
When her master arose in the morning, he opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. There was his concubine fallen at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. And he said to her, get up and let us be going. But there was no answer. So the man lifted her onto the donkey and the man got up and went to his place. Verse 29. When he entered his house, he took a knife, lay hold of his concubine, and divided her into twelve pieces, limb by limb, and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. So it was that all who saw it said, No such deed has ever been done or seen from this day that the children of Israel came up from the land of Egypt. Until this day, consider it, confer, and speak up. Wow. Nothing like that had ever been done in Israel. This man Man, this is wicked, is it not? It's wicked. This man taking his concubine, the young girl, and chopping her up into 12 pieces. It's grotesque, it's butchery, it's, it's disgusting. And he sends them to the 12 pieces, to the 12 tribes of Israel, so that no one would ever forget what happened. So no one would forget what happened. Chapter 20, verse 1. So all the children of Israel came out from Dan to Beersheba as well as the land of Gilead. And the congregation gathered together. Oh, you know what? Oh, sorry. There's something I want you to see here in verse 27. Look at this guy's heart, this Levite. When her master arose in the morning, he's asleep. He doesn't even care. He's getting some good, a good night's rest and a good night's sleep while his concubine is out there being raped and, and being abused, as well as the man's daughter. All right. The depravity of man. It's amazing. Without the Lord, let me tell you, anything is possible. So verse, chapter 20, verse 1. So the children of Israel came out. The, from Dan to Beersheba, top to bottom, as well as from the land of Gilead, in the congregation gathered together as one man before the Lord in Mizpah. And the leaders of all the people, all the tribes of Israel presented themselves. So everyone's there in the assembly of the people of God. 400,000 foot soldiers who drew the sword. Now the children of Benjamin heard that the children of Israel had gone up to Mizpah. Now the children of Israel said... Tell us how did this wicked deed happen? They're bringing accountability to the tribe of Benjamin and saying, listen, explain to us these 400,000 foot soldiers with swords drawn say, explain to us what went on. What did this Levite do? He sends like an old-fashioned or an Old Testament telegram by sending this woman, this concubine's parts, her entire body parts, to, to, to everyone, to the entire body of Christ. And everyone is just completely, completely appalled and outraged. Verse 4, so the, Levite of the hus- so the Levite, the husband of the woman who was murdered, answered and said, my concubine and I. And so he goes on in verses 4 through 7 to explain to them the story and what had happened. And so in verse 7, he says, look, all of you children of Israel, give your advice. Give me some input here and counsel here and give it to me now. I need it now. What am I to do? He says, what are we doing? Verse 8, so all the people arose as one man, so that means they're all in agreement, saying, none of us will go to his tent, nor any will turn back to his house. But now this is the thing which we will do to Gibeah. We will go up against it by lot. We will then, we will take 10 men out of every 100 Throughout all the tribes of Israel, a hundred out of every thousand and a thousand out of every ten thousand to make provision for the people 
that when visitors, when visions of the, for the people, that when they come to Gibeah in Benjamin, they may repay all the, vi- all the vileness that they have done in Israel. So all the men of Israel gathered together against the city, city of Gibeah, united together as one man. The nation is united. Oh, the standard, the flag has been raised. But what has this done to them? It's kind of like woke them up. Remember, they, they've been a people. They've been the children that are not following. There's no king. There's no authority. There's nothing governing them, their lives except for their own thoughts and their own ways of doing things. But this thing really wakes them up, and they're united together. They can't believe what's happened with their own countrymen. The butchery, this, this whole thing, really got, gets their attention. Now they're forced kind of to see what they've all become. They were now unified in something that was common, something that was together, uniting all of them together for one common goal. 12 through 17 says, Now the tribes of Israel sent men throughout all the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What is this wickedness that has occurred among you? Now therefore deliver up the men, the perverted men, who are in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and remove the evil from Israel. Does that sound familiar? They're sending their diplomatic party. Oh, this is what's happened. Uh, we're going to send our, our dip- diplomats to the, the, the Taliban, so to say, uh, in, in those places. And we want to talk things out. We want to we uh, see if you'll hand over your people, your, um, uh, those guys who have done that evil deed. Maybe those uh, uh, we can look at for 9-11. Uh, it's like us doing that, going, you know, well, can you just do us a favor and send us those guys who, you know, the whole people responsible? Yeah, no, it's not going to work. But the children of Benjamin, guess what? Would not listen to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. They said, absolutely not. Instead, the children of Benjamin gathered together from their cities to Gibeah to go to battle against the children of Israel. And from their cities at their time, the children of the Benjamin numbered 26,000 men who drew the sword besides inhabitants of Gibeah who numbered 700 select men. Among all of these people were 700 select men who were left-handed. Everyone could sling a stone at a hair's breadth and not miss. So uh, this kind of tells you about how expert they were, probably like the equivalent of the Navy SEALs of today or something, that these left-handed men, you can see what kind of damage just one rock could do, as we know with um, a Goliath. So in verse 16, again, like I said, they were left-handed. That means they were powerful. They were, they were experts at what they did. Then all the children of Israel arose, verse 18, and went up to the house of God to inquire of God. So here's the first time. This is happening, and they're saying, wow, we better go to Shiloh. We better inquire of God. They said, which of us, notice this, which of us shall go up first to battle against the children of Benjamin? They're asking God to make a choice for them. So he says, okay, hey, send Judah. All right. So the children of Israel rose in the morning and encamped against Gibeah, and the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin. And the men of Israel put themselves in battle array to fight against them at Gibeah. Verse 21, then the children of Benjamin came out of Gibeah, and on that day, look at, look, look at this, they cut down to the ground 22,000 men of the Israelites. Wow. Why is that? Are they not doing for good? I mean, they're coming against these, the, the, the tribe of Benjamin, and they're holding these, these guys who did this, this, this bad stuff to this, to this woman and, and all of this, and yet they get kind of beat up. Verse 23 Then the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until evening and asked the counsel of the Lord. So instead of giving the Lord a choice, now they're coming to him and saying, well, uh, Lord, what should we do? They're they're seeking the Lord now. Shall I again draw near for battle against the children of Israel, my, my brother Benjamin? And the Lord said, hey, go. So he says, they say, first off, which one of us should go? He says, Judah, go. Now they inquire of him again, and they're all scared, and they say, well, which one? He said, or, or what should we do? He says, go. Just go ahead and go. So the children of Israel approached the children of Benjamin on the second day. They went out again, verse 25, and Benjamin then cut down to the ground 18,000 more. 
of all of Israel who drew the sword. Amazing. Verse 26, And the children of Israel, that is, all the people went up again, third time, to the house of the Lord, and they wept. They sat there before the God, before the Lord. Now, here's the difference, folks. Here's the difference. And fasted that day until evening and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. So the children of Israel inquired of the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, you remember Phinehas? Man, the son of Eleazar, he's the guy who drove the spear right through that guy and that girl uh, way back when, as we read earlier, right through both of them in the very act. So he stands for righteousness. He stood before in the days saying, shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of my brothers Benjamin or shall I cease? And the Lord said, go up tomorrow for what? I will deliver them into your hand. Then they come up with a plan. They come up with a plan to to ambush them. And then now, let's go to verse 37. And the men in the ambush quickly rushed down upon Gibeah. The men in the ambush spread out and struck the whole city with the edge of the sword. Now the appointed signal between the men of Israel and the men in ambush was that they would make a great cloud of smoke rise up from the city, whereas the men of Israel would turn in battle. Now Benjamin had begun to strike and kill about 30 of the men of Israel, for they said, ah, surely they have defeated, they are defeated before us in the first battle. But when the cloud began to rise from the city in the column of the smoke, the Benjamites looked behind them, and there was the whole city going up in smoke to heaven. And when the men of Israel turned back, the men of Benjamin panicked, for they saw that disaster had come upon them. Therefore, they turned their backs before the men in Israel, the direction of the wilderness, but guess what? Who's waiting for them? But the battle overtook them, and and whoever came out of the cities, they destroyed in their midst." They surrounded the Benjamites, chased them, and easily trampled them down as far as front of Gibeah toward the east. And 18,000 men of Benjamin fell, as these were the men of valor. Verse 48, And the men of Israel turned back against the children of Benjamin and struck them down with the edge of the sword. From every city, men and beasts, all who were found, they also set fire to all the cities that came. Man, what an incredible, incredible victory the Lord did before them. Why did God allow 22,000 men to die initially? Why did he allow 18,000 men to die on the second round? The third time, though, is different, isn't it? The third time is really different. Why? Because it says they went before the Lord. It says they fasted and they offered burnt offerings huge key difference in what they've done. At first, they were strong in numbers. We're ready. We're ready to go out and take care of business, Lord. We're angry, and we're going to be, uh, uh, we're going to go out and take vengeance against them. We've inquired. God said, fine, you've inquired of me, so now go. But now, the third time, they offer a sacrifice. They fast, and they offer a sacrifice of repentance And I think what they do here is they recognize their own sin. They recognize their own sin as God shows them. Then he says, I'll deliver them. Because something has to die in each and every one of us, I believe. Something has to die. They they had to recognize that they were as sinful as the rest of them. That they were sinners no different from anyone else. And God says, oh, now you've offered a sacrifice. You've repented. You've fasted. You've sought me out. And now I will deliver them into your hand. They recognize their own sin. You know, for you and for me, we, we, we should fight the enemy. As far as we're in battle, we're soldiers, yeah, for sure. But I think the most important and the most needful thing is for us to recognize sin in our life and we're to repent from it fast offer sacrifice so to speak of not eating your favorite things but but fast let the Lord speak to you about any sin that's in your life it wasn't until then that they were ready to be used by the Lord 
hey, you know, I love to unfurl the flag and I love to raise up the standard and I love to show the banner of Christ. But most important, most important is repentance. That's the most important thing. In our, in our culture today, in closing, if you and I, we go against the grain of the world, we're called intolerant, we're called unloving, we're called unchristian. And those are labels by the saved and the unsaved. And if we go, if you go with the culture of today, as in those days, if you go along with it, guess what? You're heroes. But if you don't, ah, you're labeled differently. I think and I believe it's time for the church, even this church, the body of believers, to, to make a call to repentance, to repent. I don't know if you know what that means truly. But to repent. That means going to the Lord. That means truly going to Him and admitting and recognizing those things in our life that need to be eradicated, those things that need to be eliminated and saying, you know what, I am no different, but God, you are showing me these things and thank you for, for loving me so much that you are showing me, you're showing me things that cannot and should not be a part of my life because God is a redeemer and he wants to show you those things to redeem you, to save you, from things and to save your family and to save your marriages and to save your relationships with your children and all of those things he's there to save. Something has to die. What else had to die? Who else had to die? Jesus. In order for them to be salva in order for there to be salvation, for there to be redemption, Jesus had to die. I think we should just look at the death of Jesus more. I think then we'd be able to take a stand of repentance and holiness in our lives, in your lives, my life. It's about truth, guys. It's not about emotion. I think, I feel. It's about truth. And like Jesus says, what? The truth shall what? I can't hear you. Set you free. Yeah, set you free, huh? The truth shall set you free. And that's what it's about. So tonight I want to give you guys an opportunity to pray. If you're here with your spouse, then pray with your spouse. If you're here a single guy or a guy by yourself, then pair up with another guy. And you and youth, you guys can pair, pair up and pray. And if there's anything that you just, you just know, you know, you don't have to get all detail-y about it, except husbands and wives, if you want to, that's the better way. But ask the Lord for repentance in your life. Be repentant in your life. And then He can use you he wants to and he loves you. Lord, we thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you love us so much, God, that you show us this incredibly, man, awful portion of scripture, Lord, but it is for our edification. So, Lord, tonight, may that be just a begin. this be a beginning point in all of our lives, Lord, that we will truly seek repentance and ask, Lord, for you to Save us from ourselves, from the sin that might entangle us or bind us. And we thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. John, can you dim the lights, turn the lights?